Hello listeners, and thanks for downloading this interview with NASA JPL astrobiologist, Dr. Morgan Cable. We had such a good time learning all about Saturn, upcoming missions to Enceladus and Europa, and the search for life on Mars, in the outer solar system, and even in Iceland. But before we get to that, I just want to give a quick reminder for Melbourne people. Tickets are on sale for our live show with Dr. Pamela Gay on Wednesday, October 10. She'll be talking about the technology revolution in astronomy, giving a question and answer session. So if this interview gets you wondering about space or astronomy, save that question up for the show and get an expert to answer it. And after that, we'll be doing a live recording of Science on Top with Pamela as a guest. So check it out, scienceontop.com slash live. Tickets are only $20 and all the proceeds go to the non-profit Astronomical Society of the Pacific. Scienceontop.com slash live. Okay, and now here's the show. It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! A doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to a special episode of Science on Top. I'm Ed Brown and with me is Lucas Randall. Hello, Ed. And today we're delighted to be chatting with a planetary scientist and astrobiologist from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Dr. Morgan Cable. Hi. Hello. It's wonderful to have you on the show because you have a very interesting career and job and there's so much that we want to talk to you about. But uh, I thought we'd start with Cassini and the Saturn system because you were the assistant project science systems engineer for the Cassini mission, which is definitely a NASA job title because it's got that many words. (laughs) <laughs> so the Cassini mission, the spacecraft orbited Saturn system for, I think it was 13 years and brought us some of the most amazing imagery and a wealth of data and discoveries. Do you want to give us a quick rundown on Cassini and what it was like working on such a remarkable project? Sure. Uh, first, I should start off by saying that the Cassini mission started a long time before I ever worked for NASA. Typically, flagship missions, which are the the largest missions that NASA uh, produces, things like Voyager, um, the large Mars rovers, and of course Cassini, they take a long time from inception to build to launch uh, to finally getting to the place that they were designed to explore and and doing that exploration. And so I joined the Cassini mission uh, very late on in uh, what they called the last phase of its mission uh, and was lucky enough to join what essentially had become a family, right? A lot of these mm. scientists and engineers had been working together for a couple of decades at this point. And, you know, people had named their kids after moons of Saturn because they were born during that mission. It was a, a really amazing group of people uh, to join. And I felt wor- very fortunate uh, to be one of the people to say that I was lucky enough to work with them. Sorry, people named their kids after the moons of Saturn. So, this is my son, Titan. This is my daughter, Enceladus. Is that- <laughs> Maybe not Titan and Enceladus, but there, there are a lot of very cool named moons. There are a lot of moons, uh, yeah. Saturn. Uh, Janice, Phoebe. I actually named my cat after one of those moons. But- <laughs> very cool. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> no worries. It was a really amazing mission and like you said was in the Saturn system for 13 years originally we had only proposed to send Cassini there for four years but luckily NASA over engineers all of their <laughs> space we had plenty of fuel left over and so we went back to to uh, NASA headquarters and to the US government and said hey our spacecraft is going great after four years in the Saturn system can we have a little more money to keep going and they said yes and they did that twice actually Uh, which is why we were able to be in the Saturn system for 13 years until we really did run out of gas. Um, At that point, we had to, uh, quote-unquote, dispose of the spacecraft somewhere safe. Uh, Cassini, in a way, was a victim of its own success. Before Cassini got to the Saturn system, we had no idea there was liquid water that far out. We had no clue. And uh, once Cassini had found places like Enceladus that had liquid water spewing into space, places where life as we know it uh, could survive, 
we knew we couldn't just let the spacecraft drift around there uncontrollably after uh, it ran out of gas because there is a chance however small that potentially Cassini could crash in maybe a thousand years maybe 10,000 years it could crash on Enceladus or on Titan or some of these places with liquid water and accidentally contaminate them and we didn't want that to happen so we decided to do this amazing grand finale swan dive right into Saturn itself, and we collected data until we lost contact with the spacecraft. That was September of last year. It was a, a really amazing day. It was very early in the morning. Uh, all of the engineers and scientists from the Cassini mission from those decades all uh, converged on Pasadena. We were all at Caltech together, and I remember it was it was really surreal as we watched that signal die out, and we had to say goodbye to such an amazing spacecraft. It was incredibly poetic, I thought, the, the you know, taking it into Saturn itself after such a long period of time. Um, it, it must have felt like they, they were very much wedded together anyway, but it just, it just seemed like a beautiful end to me. Yeah, and we were able to collect data that we never thought possible. I mean, especially when you first get to yeah. the place that you're planning to explore, you take it really easy and you play it safe, super safe, right? And in the last phase of Cassini's mission, we did these uh, ring grazing orbits where we went skimming along the surface of the rings, which before we thought was so way cool. too risky. <laughs> yeah. And then we went between Saturn and its rings, an area where we had no idea if there were particles large enough to completely obliterate the spacecraft. Turns out there aren't. It's actually a pretty benign part of space. Um, but we were able to take these risks that we never would have in the first couple of years of the mission. Uh, it was a really fun time to be part of that mission. I played around with a short story um, back then. So total off to the side sort of comment. But um, I, I was thinking, you know, what, what happens if there was, if there were, you know, things big enough to basically obliterate Cassini whilst it was doing this stuff. And I imagined a scenario whereby Cassini actually became another ring. Of Saturn. I thought that would have been really cool. Uh, <laughs> you know, it would have also, over time. That's it would, an yeah, yeah, exactly. Good point. And anytime yeah. that we put a spacecraft at risk, we always do a very detailed analysis of exactly what the risks are, measure those against the rewards. And I'm really glad that we made that decision uh, for Cassini. Hopefully, we won't end up um, having some of our spacecraft become rings of other planets because I feel like they wouldn't operate quite as well if they did that. But Although kind of a beautiful well, thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that does remind me, I, and this might be just a, a rumor that might be apocryphal, but isn't there still a part of Cassini orbiting Saturn? Isn't there like a lens cap or something that fell off and is still out there? Am I right? That is true. It didn't wow. fall off. It was ejected on purpose. Uh, so a lot of instruments have very sensitive electronics and very sensitive optical surfaces. And typically, whenever you launch something from Earth atmosphere into space, uh, some things that were before at you know normal, happy Earth temperature, uh, pressure, and um, and those conditions, when they go into space, they might outgas. So they might um, have some some um, solvents or some other things on them boil away, and that stuff doesn't just leave the spacecraft completely, it launched with Cassini, so it's going to be moving at the same speed as Cassini. And so in a way, a lot of these spacecraft kind of form their own little micro-atmospheres. And that sounds cool, but it's actually really not, um, because some instruments, we might cool them down, certain pieces, and if there's gas floating around, if it finds those pieces, it's going to freeze to them and condense. And so we've learned in the past to be very careful with some of our instruments and keep them covered and protected until they get to the place they're going. Now Cassini took uh, seven years to get from Earth to Saturn. It's Space is big, it takes a while. And so we had some of these instruments, we kept their covers on until right after we did Saturn orbit insertion and we screamed by Titan kind of close, and Titan's got an atmosphere with some other stuff. We didn't want to muck up anything. And so after we did that um, key orbit trim maneuver, then we uh, ejected that. I forget exactly which instrument that was for, but there's at least one little piece of Cassini floating around. Wow. And plus the, uh, the Huygens probe uh, sitting on, on Titan as well. For, for there's also and that. And that is very true. Um, we cleaned the outside of Cassini and we cleaned Huygens pretty well. Uh, luckily the surface of Titan is <laughs> what, 
90 Kelvin. Yeah, well, we have other other ways that we can either <laughs> clean or sterilize spacecraft. But interestingly, we did not sterilize Cassini. Uh, that's why we crashed into Saturn. Mm-hmm. We we considered it, um, it was a, the safety level two, not three, which is where you decide to completely, like, sterilize right. the surface. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, bit of history there. Wow. Um, but, yeah, so the Hoyans probe uh, on Titan, that was obviously at the very beginning of the uh, time that uh, Cassini was in Saturn system. That landed and, and went through the atmosphere of Titan, because Titan has an atmosphere, and I just think it's awesome that moons have atmospheres. And then it landed. What did we learn from that? We learned a ton. So one of the coolest things about planetary science is you do as much as you possibly can looking at something remotely uh, through a telescope or something like that. Then NASA or, or the European Space Agency, or both in this case, will send a mission like Cassini there. But there's only so much you can learn from orbit of a place like Titan. And thanks to ESA, we were able to land the Huygens probe. And whenever you get in situ data, that's data in the place, like physically going and touching the surface, that's when you really learn the most about the place that you're interested in. And thanks to the Huygens probe, we were able to measure a lot of the organic compounds that are present in Titan's atmosphere and on its surface, things that we had clues of uh, using some of our remote sensing tools, but this was a way to concretely verify that they were there. We found uh, molecules like um, acetylene, which is a a complex organic molecule here that if you look at it funny, will explosively polymerize, which is fun. Uh, We found benzene, a whole bunch of, of organic molecules. And the really interesting thing is a lot of these molecules, if you make them here on Earth, and you dissolve them in liquid water, you make amino acids, which is pretty exciting. So we found a lot of hints and clues that Titan may have the ingredients for life as we know it. Even though it's very cold on the surface, chances are our kind of life couldn't exist there. But Titan has this liquid water ocean underneath all the cool stuff happening on its surface. Deep down underneath a crust of ice, it's got liquid water. And so if these organic molecules are getting pulled or pushed down there, mixing with that liquid water, you could have a really friendly environment for life. It was really stunning seeing seeing you know some of the imagery as well because we it, it, it didn't occur to to me that that you know a body that was effectively shrouded in this this very dense atmosphere all the time would look so earth-like in terms of its topography and the, you know mountains and as you say lakes obviously not lakes of water but it, it was uh, really stunning how how earth-like it was. Yeah, it looks very similar, and yet, from a compositional standpoint, it's so different. Titan right. has clouds, just like Earth does, except they're not made out of water. On Titan, the clouds, the liquid phase, is made out of liquid methane and ethane, liquid hydrocarbons, things that are gases here on Earth. But in Titan, they're cold enough, and so uh, Titan actually has a hydrological cycle, just like here on Earth, where these uh, compounds, they form clouds, they rain, it may even snow on Titan. They carve uh, river channels and gullies and things like that into the surface. And then they pool in lakes in the north and south pole of Titan. And uh, Cassini made a lot of these discoveries. Some of them were hypothesized by people like Carl Sagan from the Voyager probes that both went screaming by the Saturn system. But uh, we didn't know for, for sure that this existed until Cassini. So after all this discoveries with Cassini and all that, and then you, you deorbited it and it burned up in uh, Saturn's atmosphere, what then, like what happens to everyone who worked on Cassini when the mission ends? Do they, are they well, unemployed? Do they go to other projects? That is a great question. And actually, a lot of them are meeting right now as we speak in Boulder, Colorado. There's a science symposium happening. And this is uh, about a year on from end of mission, which was last year in September. Uh, So a lot of the engineers have moved on to working on other projects. Some of the scientists may spend some of their time working on new things. For example, uh, I've joined the Europa Clipper team and also this Europa Lander concept. But a lot of us will still continue to analyze Cassini data for years to come. I'm still doing Titan research in the laboratory, comparing it to Cassini data. And I know a lot of my colleagues on the mission are doing the same thing. Uh, One of the things that we're realizing is that the the data from that mission is going to it's going to fuel 
PhDs of many graduate students to come. Um, there was just a recent announcement of some former Galileo scientists going back and looking at that data. That was a mission that went to the Jupiter system and uh, studied Europa, and they just found some new evidence for uh, what they think are plumes happening uh, off the surface of Europa. And so it's it's amazing. You think that you've sort of mined all of the, the juicy bits out of these data sets, and then you make some new discovery or have a new theory, or maybe you come up with some new uh, computational method for analyzing things, and you can go back and look at it all over again find things that you never knew were there. Yeah, I, this is something that we cover uh, quite a lot in the show, various um, studies or new information that's brought to light from old data, as you say, and, it could, and, and it's amazing how often it's, it's from data from missions that are, that are such a long time ago or observations that were made a long time ago, but fresh set of eyes, fresh idea, fresh perspective, um, and, and it can just bring this an enormous wealth of information forward. And especially once the data is made you know, publicly available. And I, and I know with NASA, all the NASA missions, um, that, that data has to be made available to the public yes, as part of their... Yeah, yeah. It's part so, of the planetary science data system. Anyone can access it. It doesn't matter if you're a scientist or not. You can be just a hobbyist who's interested in maybe image processing, and you can download all of the, the images from Cassini and do your own processing yourself. That is just so good. <laughs> not that I've done it, to be honest with you. I, I wouldn't know where to I start. Really, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, we we touched briefly on on Enceladus before, and, and obviously, uh, um, you know, that we, there's the Enceladus Life Finder mission as well that we'd love to have a bit of a chat with you about. But but Enceladus is is uh, is certainly a world that has has really captured our attention, just because it's it's been so unexpected. It's just this this tiny little world. It, it, can you tell us a little bit about the the um, the impact that the Enceladus findings had on the mission team? Sure. Yeah, we um, had no idea that Enceladus was going to be nearly as interesting. It's kind of a small moon. It's about the size of the state of Arizona. So, uh, you know, a few hundreds of kilometers across. And it is the whitest and brightest body in the solar system. So it did have that sort of point of interest um, going Fine. into the Cassini mission. But we had no idea it was going to become quite as fascinating. Now, uh, when Cassini first went and did a close flyby of Enceladus, like it did of many of Saturn's moons. We had a couple of instruments trained on it. Uh, we had uh, some cameras that noticed that there was this, um, this interesting phenomenon going on in the South Pole. Uh, we also were able to go back and look at it with what's essentially a heat camera. We found that there were some hot spots at the South Pole. Um, and at this point, we were able to do what's called an occultation, so that's where uh, Cassini actually put the moon between us and the sun. So we were able to see sort of the peer through, like through, the plume, um, peer through that plume and then look at the, the stuff as sort of some of that material blocked the sunlight. And um, it's, there's a bit of a debate in terms of who actually found the evidence for the plume first. I think uh, the imaging science subsystem can claim some of that. The ultraviolet instrument can as well, um, and the magnetometer, which uh, was able to detect some magnetic fluctuations that could only be there if there were lots of charged particles around. And so I think it's a great example of how a lot of these instruments aboard Cassini worked in concert to end up coming to the same conclusion, that indeed there is a plume. It's coming out of the south pole of Enceladus uh, through these giant uh, four fissures that we call the tiger stripes because it looks like a tiger just went and clawed the, yeah. the bottom of this this tiny moon and once we knew the plume was there we did one of those cost benefit analyses and decided that it was worth the risk to fly through it because Cassini has a couple of instruments that it sort of would be like the spacecraft sticking out its tongue and tasting what is there. Oh, I love that analogy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is very cool. Except you're flying at, you know, many times the speed of a speeding bullet and the tongue is made out of a, a hard metal surface that's not going to get obliterated when you um, grab some of these grains. And so we flew through and we analyzed the composition of some of the ice grains. And that's when things got really interesting because um, we found evidence that there's a liquid water ocean uh, we were able to, based on the composition, figure out what the pH of that ocean is, what salts are present in there, and we also found a lot of organic molecules, and that was when things got really exciting. Very cool. <laughs> so just, uh, 
you've 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 um, reminded me of another thing that I wanted to discuss with you as well. Just in terms of the instruments that are selected for a mission, such as you know a, a planetary mission. Um, there's there's I assume there's 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 a very long process of of this cost benefit sort of scenario where you know the the instruments that give you the the greatest potential for for finding data uh, are selected. But I imagine there's a lot of bidding between different teams to to get their instrument included in the mission. There is a very highly competitive process, and I think NASA has done a very good job of trying to balance all of the sort of desires from the scientists that are involved with the mission uh, against the right payload. Because uh, ideally, we'd like to bring all the things and make all the measurements. But of course, we, <laughs> we don't have the space for that. Uh, and so sometimes you have to make some very difficult decisions based on mass, power, volume constraints, um, or even based on you know complementarity of certain instruments. Uh, for example, there's a pretty tragic story that happened with Cassini. Uh, one of our instruments ended up having an electrical issue early on that uh, whenever that instrument was on, it would cause a short or a fault or something that was messing up some of the other instruments. Um, and we ended up having to turn it off and basically keep this instrument off for most of Cassini's mission. Um, and I, I think the name was CAPS. Um, I'm looking it up now because <laughs> I don't want to say something that was wrong. Um, uh, and so basically because this instrument, we, we couldn't keep it on during most of the mission, um, we ended up sort of taking that science team from that instrument and merging them with the rest of Cassini and sort of absorb them into different parts of the mission so they could still be involved even though their instrument itself uh, wasn't able to be on uh, most of the time. I can, only, I can only imagine the disappointment though after so many years of planning yeah. and so much, you know, planning for, for what you're going to do with the instrument itself and how the data is going to be shared across the community and it must just be, be heartbreaking when that sort of thing happens. Mm. It would. Yeah, but that sort of stuff happens all the time. I mean, we get really spoiled with missions like Cassini that work so beautifully. I mean, our mm. head systems engineer, the person in charge of the health and safety for the spacecraft, she proudly said that we were at room temperature on the inside of the spacecraft bus, which is the nominal temperature, up until we lost contact with the spacecraft. Now, think about that. That's, That's amazing. Seven years of cruise plus 13 years of operations, all with it working perfectly. I mean, that's really incredible. So that that's that is it's stunning. I mean, from a from an engineering perspective, that's just incredible to fathom. It's a testament to the hard work and dedication of all of the engineers that work on mm. every single NASA mission. You know, we train them really well, and they're incredible at their jobs. And as a scientist, that's we can't do the science that we want to do without them. So it's a, a real privilege to be able to work with such great people. So just, just another question about instrumentation. This one more is about the naming of the instrument. Something that we <laughs> often talk about on the show is NASA and JPL seem to have quite a penchant for making names out of terms that they kind of just, well, the first letter of that word doesn't fit into a handy word, so we'll just take the second letter of that word and turn it into a handy. Is there a team at NASA <laughs> who kind of help the well, science teams, the engineering teams come up with these names? There are a couple of people that, that I know of that are remarkably good at making up acronyms, and usually they'll get pinged if there's a, a particularly difficult instrument uh, right. or mission that we're, we're having trouble coming up with a cool name for. That's one of the more fun things that we get to do. Usually uh, all members of the team will get to contribute. We'll sort of brainstorm and try to come up with something cool. And um, sometimes we, we end up really lucky and that name follows the mission all the way through. But sometimes mission names will actually change. Um, right. In the proposal phase, when you're proposing a mission, it might have some name. But then you may find for, I don't know, copyright reasons, maybe there was some previous mission concept that had that same name, you might have to change it later on. Right. So sometimes right. these grow and evolve sort of as the mission grows and evolves. So Enceladus Life Finder Elf, did you come up with that name? Is that your name, Morgan? <laughs> that was not my name. Um, <laughs> I really like it. We, we had a lot of discussions. Um, I was sort of part, um, 
I had proposed to name it after Carl Sagan and not have it be an acronym, um, but mine got shot down. But Jonathan, if you're listening, we could propose that one again. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is a mission concept. It hasn't been selected yet. We've uh, proposed it twice now, and we're planning on proposing it again. Uh, after the amazing discoveries of the Cassini mission, it's clear that Enceladus is one of our top astrobiology targets to finally answer that question of, are we alone? Is there life out there elsewhere, even in our own cosmic backyard? And ELF would, uh, if it were selected, would hopefully answer that question. And what's its plan? So the plan for ELF, uh, which is still a concept, I have to emphasize that it's not a mission yet, would be to go to the Saturn system. It would do flybys of Enceladus. So it would be an orbit around Saturn. And about every two months would do a flyby through the plume of Enceladus. And just like Cassini was able to sort of stick out its tongue and taste the molecules and the ice grains that were there, ELF would be able to do that, but with much more specialized and sensitive instruments. Now, when Cassini was designed and built, it was never meant to be a seafaring mission, right? We had no idea there was liquid water out that far. Um, but now we know better. And so we have state-of-the-art mass spectrometers, instruments that are designed to uh, look at the molecules that are there and tell us exactly what they're made of. And the goal would be to look for evidence of life as we know it or life as we don't know it. And mm -hmm. our goals would be to look for key patterns in organic molecules that we know were there. Cassini found organics, but it didn't have the resolution to tell us exactly what those organics were. Uh, with ELF, the payload is designed specifically to be able to do that. So we could tell you if there were amino acids there, if there were components of cells, of things that would typically exist in liquid water. Even if it was life that evolved completely independently of life here on Earth, it still would have to survive in liquid water, and that applies some rules that we can use in terms of what we might look for. And so we spent a lot of time, the science team did, brainstorming as agnostic of life detection um, strategies as we could come up with. So we were trying not to be earth centric. It's really hard because that's our only example of life as we know it. But we were trying to come up with other patterns that we might be able to see that even if those organisms in that alien ocean were completely weird and wacky and used different building blocks and, and different energy molecules, that we'd still be able to see their, their presence with the payload for ELF. And so I want to drill down on that because we talk about liquid water so much when it comes to life and we're finding liquid water throughout the solar system. Why is it that we, if that liquid water is so important? Is it just because we have that one data set here on Earth that all life needs liquid water? Or is there more to it than that? Is there like chemistry reasons for that? Well, there are chemistry reasons for needing a liquid not necessarily liquid water, but anything that is able to be a fluid medium. Um, a lot of times people will ask about weird life and bring up the, um, is it the, the whole, what was it from Star Trek? The, the silica-based life form, the solid? Yep, the crystalline yeah, yeah. life form. Exactly. Yeah. Um, which could be possible, but think about the sort of processes that are needed to be alive. You need to eat food. And then you use that, those nutrients to do the molecular machinery that keeps you alive, and then you generate waste, right? Well, if you're in a solid medium, um, it's very difficult to sort of get new access to new nutrients and to get rid of those waste products. Whereas if you're in a liquid phase, that's a much more straightforward problem. So that's one of the reasons why uh, I would say most people argue that liquid is useful for life to be able to do the things it needs to be alive. Now, liquid water has some key things that make it ideal as a solvent for life. It's what's called a polar solvent. Now, if you remember from high school chemistry, uh, that means that like dissolves like, and so it can dissolve anything else that's polar too, or things that have a charge. And that means that water can dissolve very large molecules. Um, a lot of the molecules in our cells um, and in bacteria are very big. And the only reason that they can stay floating around in liquid water is because they have charged groups on them. And that allows them to, even though they're, they're much too big, to still be able to float around and move around. In a solvent like liquid methane or ethane, like we see on Titan, 
that is a different story. Uh, those liquids are nonpolar. They're the opposite of water. And so that means that they can't handle charged groups as well, and large molecules just can't dissolve. So if there were to be life in a liquid methane lake on Titan, it would have to be very different from any life that we knew of here on Earth, and it would probably need to use completely different chemistry. Now, it doesn't mean it's not possible. It just means that energetically and from a chemistry standpoint, it's a little bit more challenging. Okay. Um, I, well, we got a bit sidetracked then because I, I should have stayed on the um, spacecraft topic because you mentioned Europa Clipper that you're working on now. Do you want to give us a summary of that? Oh, I'd love to. <laughs> it's an the next flagship mission that uh, NASA is putting forward, it's a collaboration from a lot of different institutions all over the world, uh, and this is going to explore specifically Jupiter's moon Europa. Now, kind of like Cassini did, uh, the Europa Clipper mission is going to do orbits around the gas giant. It'll do orbits around Jupiter and do close flybys of Europa's surface. We're going to have a payload that will be able to map the surface in much higher resolution than ever before. We'll have a couple of those similar instruments that Cassini had to taste any molecules that are sputtered off the surface of Europa, or if there is indeed a plume, we'll be able to grab some of those molecules and see what they're made of. Uh, we'll also have uh, some sensitive spectrometers that will be able to map the composition of the surface from orbit. Uh, we'll have a, a heat sensor, so we'll be able to look for hot spots. And the goal of this mission is to understand the habitability of Europa, to try to figure out if it does have the conditions suitable for life as we know it, um, or if it did in the past. Uh, we may be able to see some evidence of life if it is there today, but the main goal is to look for habitability, really characterize this fascinating moon of Jupiter. And this is not just a proposed mission, this is one that's actually got the go-ahead and the going full steam ahead with it, yeah? That is correct. So uh, missions typically go through multiple phases. Uh, we label them A through F because we're very creative. Um, and uh, right now, Clipper is about to enter uh, phase C, which is, uh, that means that they've already figured out what payload they're bringing with them. They've done a lot of studies to make sure that those instruments are the right ones and they've they will s soon start building those instruments. Uh, in phase D, they'll integrate them all into the spacecraft, so they'll sort of bolt them all on. Uh, phase E is is operation, so that includes launch and, and uh, traveling over to the Jupiter system and conducting the mission ops. And then phase F is the, the sad one, disposal. So we don't talk about that until mm. far, far future. I loved reading about the, um, the reasons for the decision to not have Clipper orbiting Europa itself but orbiting Jupiter and doing all of these these you know flybys was it I think it's 47 or so flybys it's going to do over three and a half years because um, with Jupiter obviously we've got a, a couple of issues in terms of its you know br its vast magnetosphere and also the radiation that it has to deal with um, yeah. so there were there were there were concerns and I'd, I'd love to to uh, to hear a bit more about this from other than what I've read on online but concerns I believe about just giving the instrument time to send the data back to Earth. Yeah, it's a combination of, of a bunch of reasons for why we decided to not go into orbit around Europa itself. Uh, you're exactly right. Part of that is just to make sure, I mean, the data rates, we're talking huge distances to get out to Jupiter. The light time alone is in like the, the what is it, half an hour, I think. Uh, light time one way to get out to Jupiter, is that correct? It's It's... Space is big, and that means that <laughs> space is big. We can all agree. <laughs> yeah, and that means that our data rate back to Earth is it's far far slower than any sort of internet connection, even back when the internet first started. And so that means we need some time, especially for these high resolution images. Uh, one of the instruments is going to be sending us image cubes because it'll add a, a spectroscopy component onto those pictures, and that's a lot of data. We want to make sure that we get that back and are able to look at it and give us a little bit of time to understand what it means um, before some of the subsequent flybys. Now, we may not end up changing. We've got a, a pretty detailed tour already set out 
But let's say that we end up discovering that the plume is real around Europa. We may want to tweak some of our future flybys to angle it so that we're going right through it so we can um, stick out our tongue and grab some of those particles. Or maybe we find something else interesting on the surface that we can only fathom now. The Galileo mission was the last mission to be in the Jupiter system. That was back in the 90s. And because of a, a an issue with its high gain antenna not opening completely, we weren't able to get very much of our images back at all. And so a lot of Europa's surface is still really enigmatic at this point. We're hoping to find a lot of fantastic new discoveries with the Europa Clipper mission. And did I read something that there were add-ons that they were uh, thinking about, like a, a lander or some other orbiters as well. Uh, is there any progress on that or are they just fiction at this well, time? Well, so the current plan is to move Europa Clipper forward as, as written, sort of as it's proposed right now. Uh, any sort of change to the payload or adding on new elements um, could push it over the sort of maximum mass number that would allow it to still fit on the large rocket that we're planning on launching it on. Uh, there is a proposal concept, a mission concept going forward right now that would be a lander. It's called the Europa Lander. We're very creative. We don't have a cool name for it yet. <laughs> oh, it'll come, I'm sure. I know it will. And uh, I'm actually part of the project science team for that. And we're we're really hopeful that that will also move forward. Because uh, like I said before, one of the powerful combinations of the Cassini mission was having all this orbital imagery and then dropping the Huygens probe and getting that real in situ sort of a ground truth. And if we're able to do that with a partner mission that would be completely independent of Clipper, but still be able to launch uh, and land in about that same time period. So Clipper presumably would still be around um, at that time. That would be super powerful. To be able to actually cut into the surface of Europa, grab a sample and look at what's inside. Um, it's It would be a really incredible thing. I, I'm very hopeful that that mission will move forward. Of course, that depends on funding in Congress and uh, all sorts of approvals. Uh, but we've, we're doing the best we can on our end to be sure that if this mission concept does move forward, it'll be the right one with the right payload to answer the question that we're all itching to ask. Is there life on Europa? That would be amazing. I really hope it does get the go ahead. That'd be really cool. Yeah. Sorry, Lucas. Oh, me too. And that there was there were a couple of other add-ons as well. I was reading about some potential nano satellites for uh, for doing a little, you know, getting in into some Europa orbits and 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 studying plumes a little bit more and that sort of thing. They they look really cool because um, cubesats and that sort of thing, uh, in terms of the scale and cost, uh, are a lot more achievable. They really are. In fact, there are a couple of cubesats on their way to Mars right now that launched with the Insight mission. Um, and I think th those are the first interplanetary CubeSats ever. So we're breaking new ground with CubeSats and microsatellite technology all the time. Uh, if you're curious about learning more about those, it's the, the MARCO mission, Mars Cube One, uh, is the name of those those two small satellites. Amazing. Yeah, one of the CubeSats, so I just got to point this out, one of the CubeSats that's being considered is called DarkSide. DarkSide. <laughs> <laughs> Do we? <laughs> Very it's cool. Mini Maggie, Dark Side, and uh, Sylph. So yeah, no, I like. I love yeah, that. I was part of the Sylph proposal. That that was a lot of fun. It'll be very interesting if any of those are, are able to be included in the payload. That would be incredible. Yeah, and I'm sorry. I think we may have broken one of the golden rules that you try not to talk about uh, missions that are just in proposal phase because so many things oh, no. get cancelled and don't go ahead. So hopefully we haven't <laughs> jinxed anything. <laughs> Right. They get like, affected by James Webb Space Telescope's uh, yes. budgetary, budgetary gravity. <laughs> well, it's something that's important for all of us to keep in mind, and especially when you're talking to the public, there are a lot of people out there who may want to become scientists or engineers one day, and I think it's important for them to get a realistic idea of, you know, we have all of these dreams and all of these plans for missions, but of course we don't have an infinite budget. And so we've got to make some hard decisions and that's okay. Cause that means that the missions that finally make it through are the best of the very best. And that's why they're able to operate as long as they do and uh, make the incredible discoveries they're making. I mean, the, the opportunity Rover on Mars is what 13, no, 14 years oh, old no. now. It's just crazy. It was only such a great mission. Three months. So yeah, yeah it's, it's amazing. 
Yeah, very cool. We need to bring it back down to earth though now. And we we're talking about the search for life. You've just come, been come back from Iceland. And I think you've been there a few times now. And yeah, that's right. what are you doing there about searching for life? How is that involved? Well, so Iceland is actually a pretty decent analog for Mars. Iceland is one of the most volcanically active areas uh, on planet Earth. And luckily for us, a lot of those volcanic zones uh, have been protected by the, the rangers, the park rangers there. And a few science teams, like the, the team I'm a part of, where we came up with a great nickname. We're called Feldspar, which is an acronym that actually stands for something. I'm not going to spell it all the way out here. But um, so we work very closely with the park rangers up in Iceland, and they've cordoned off a spot of this brand new uh, lava field. This one uh, erupted in 2014 and 2015. So it's like three or four years old now. Some bits of it are still quite hot. Uh, but the reason that we like fresh lava fields is because now we can watch as life starts to colonize these. And we can get some lessons as to uh, where life gains a foothold, uh, what other factors may contribute to microbial communities, sort of being able to start to grow and develop and become more complex. And this is really useful for us, especially for this upcoming Mars mission, Mars 2020. This is our, our new flagship for Mars that is planning on collecting and caching 38 samples that ultimately, through a couple of other missions, will make their way back to Earth. Now, when those samples get back here, they will be uh, by mass, the most expensive substance in the world. <laughs> From scientific value, of course, they're, they're going to be incredibly important. And so we want to be sure that those 38 samples are the right ones. Um, and some of the stuff that we're doing in Iceland, we hope, will help inform that, uh, that selection process. Wow, I didn't realize that Mars 2020 was going to be a sample return mission. That's amazing. Well, it's part of a three a multi-mission attempt um, to to do Mars sample returns. So the idea is that Mars 2020 will collect and cache 38 samples and then we'll leave them down on the surface. A uh, follow-on mission would come uh, get to Mars, land, grab those samples, and then bring them up into Mars orbit. And then a third mission would come collect those from Mars orbit and bring them back to Earth. Wow. Uh, the reason take so many missions is because it takes a lot of fuel. I mean, you have to bring all of the gas with you to Mars that you would then use to um, land and then take back off again and then leave Mars orbit. I mean, it's a really complicated problem, but a bunch of NASA scientists and engineers have been wrapping their head around this problem for a while. And this is the solution we've got right now. Now, it means it's going to happen in phases, um, but that's okay. I mean, I think we've We've got the technology now to do this right, and scientists are willing to wait to make sure that it's done properly to be sure that the samples we get back here have minimized contamination and hopefully are the ones that we've selected to be the right ones to give us a good assessment of whether or not Mars is habitable now or ever was in its history. Wow. Okay. So my afternoon is set. I'm just going to be studying everything about those sample return missions. Um, yeah. So how do you do this um, in, in Iceland, looking for the right places to um, search for life. Is it, are you doing sort of taking rock samples and scraping them off and testing them? And what would tell me through the process of choosing the right places to find life? Well, the idea is we pick our sample sites in a similar way to how we do on Mars. So we start off with sort of remote sensing data, which for us is Google Earth images. And um, then once we pick our sites, now, this is when we can deviate from what the Mars rovers do. So Mars rovers have very limited uh, amounts of reagents and numbers of samples that they can collect to do any analysis. Whereas us, we have a team of about 14 people, and we can collect all the samples. And so that's what we do. Is we collect samples on different spatial scales. So we start off with um, two spots that are maybe a centimeter apart. And then we go 10 centimeters away and collect another one. Then we go a meter, 10 meters, 100 meters. And we've even collected things on the kilometer scale. And we do this over regions that look very similar um, by eye and from some of our, our analysis that we bring with us. And then we study how life changes over those different spatial scales. And we're trying to link that to key differences in, say, 
um, mineralogy or a composition that you can't always tell right away. But there are hints that if we can do some standoff analyses on Mars, we can say, okay, that's the spot you want to dig. Um, you don't want to dig 10 centimeters to the left or to the right. You want to dig right there. That's like a calibration process. Yeah. It, like it is, learning. in a way. Yeah. 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 But that uh, actually ties in with something that you were saying about sending the, Le the Huygens probe and uh, remote sensing and all that. There's only so much that we can do with probes on in the atmosphere and or outside the atmosphere you often need to actually get down on the ground and looking up close is there an argument to think that we don't need to be looking to send humans to mars to do the experiments are we at a point where we can just use rovers for that sort of stuff or are there still huge advantages to be had from actual human beings that is a really good question um I think that there are benefits and drawbacks to both approaches. I mean, when we first designed um, Spirit and Opportunity, the Mars Exploration Rovers, we designed them to be the height of an average person, um, precisely because that's how geologists tend to perceive their world. Like, their their most useful tool is their eyes. And uh, if we had placed a camera at, you know, waist height or something like that, it would have been much more difficult for standard terrestrial geologists to be able to look at the, the, the different features on Mars and make any conclusions about them. So I think we've had people in mind at every step of our robotic exploration of any of these bodies. I mean, that's all we're doing is extending our senses as best we can out to these places. And ultimately, I do think we're going to need a person there to be able to flip over a key rock or notice something that you know might be difficult to see in the, the pan cam from some future Mars rover. There, there are key differences when a human analyzes a, a place versus when you do it robotically. But robots are always going to be our first frontier, our way of being able to get to the places that are too hazardous, um, too risky to send people. So I think there's a lot of complementarity there. And I, I think that Mars is going to be a great proving ground once we're finally able to send people there. Do you have anything, Lucas, you wanted to say? Well, other than I just think you surely must just pinch yourself every day for having such an incredibly cool about, career. I, yeah. It's just There's a sign it's just at the front of the NASA center where I work. As I drive into work, it says, welcome to our universe. And every time <laughs> oh. I just kind of get all giddy and happy. And maybe that will wear off after a while. But I've been there see, since 2005. Man, I've been there 13 years now. and, and oh, hasn't, oh. Yeah. <laughs> That's just That's just fantastic. It's really, really great. And I saw, I was just um, scrolling through uh, your profile page on um, on the JPL uh, site. One of your publications jumped out at me that you co-authored with uh, Dr. Helen Maynard Casely, who's a friend of the show, been on the show many, many, many times, a co-crystal. Yeah, that, so um, she's just, just fantastic. But uh, it's been such such a, a wonderful uh, chat with you. It's It's been awesome. Thank you so much for spending this time with us. Well, thank you so much for having me and for, you know, your curiosity and your interest. All the stuff that we're doing, uh, exploring the solar system and the rest of the universe is to understand our place in it. And as long as there are curious people out there, it's going to be a worthwhile cause to continue to pursue. I'm sorry. I know we have to wrap up, but I cannot finish this without asking you about Mooney. I don't even know if I pronounced that oh wrong. What is God. Mooney? It told me about this the other night. <laughs> I can't believe this. Oh. <laughs> That's uh, mountain unicycling, or Muni for short. Um, it's it's a sport. It's a hobby. It's a lot of fun. It's um, <laughs> one of the few things I can do where I have to be completely focused on what I'm doing. Because if you let your mind drift, you're going to fall over because you're on one wheel a lot of pads, and you pick the most challenging trail you can possibly find, and you go down it or up it. I'm still working on the uphill. That's takes some massive quads. How <laughs> bad? This, so this is basically mountain biking on a unicycle. Is that? Yeah. Am I understand it correctly? Yeah, we got rid of all the bits you don't need. <laughs> <laughs> 
How does this Ow, even, the, like, I you sh- just, so, <laughs> this is, like, so mind-blogging to me, even more so than all the other stuff we've talked about, which is amazing. How do you get into this? You just, you, did you see something online? Did you go, hey, there's a new... Um, I met this really cute guy who did that, um, and now we're married, and so we <laughs> go writing. Pretty regular. <laughs> Wow. Oh, I love it. A fairy tale story <laughs> of mountain unicycling. Uh, <laughs> fantastic. Wow. Oh, fun. Oh, well, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been eye opening and so much fun. Well, thank you again. And yeah, stay curious. <laughs> Is there anything you wanted to plug or uh, where can people go to find you online? Oh, gosh. Um, just. Any, any of the NASA websites, jpl.nasa.gov is a great resource. Uh, if you're interested in any of the work that uh, Helen Minor Casely and I have been doing on Titan, uh, we've got a couple of papers out on that. Um, I suggest just searching for like Titan Mineral and our names and you can probably find those. If you have any other questions, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm on Twitter, at uh, Stars Are Calling is my Twitter handle. And it's been a real pleasure. Thank you both. No, thank you very much. We'll have all those links in the show notes, of course. And um, I've got nothing more to say except thank you so much. Thank you.